You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to Filmmaking Conversations with Damian Swaby. Listen to conversations with award-winning filmmakers, directors from the golden age of television, and creatives from the indie film community who continue to inspire the next generation of filmmakers. And now, over to your host, Damian Swaby. Dave, Dustin, yeah. how are you both doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having us on. No, thanks for coming on. Really, really appreciate it. You've made an important documentary that shed lights on things that I certainly didn't know about, um, even though I have a certain experience in that situation from afar. So thanks for coming on and thanks for making the documentary. And before I go on about the documentary and dig deep into how it came about and why it came about, please you tell us who you are, what you do, and why did you come to make the documentary? Dustin, go ahead. Uh, Dave, I was going to say, do you want me to start? And how's that go? I met Dave in college. He was the first residence assistant assigned that I was assigned to. So I became his problem in, what, 1996? A while ago. And, uh, a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we we got along like pretty well. And we talked about making movies while we were in school. He, he went on to a career in law enforcement. And I kind of followed animation school all the way to Glasgow, where uh, I got my postgrad done at the Glasgow School of Art. Cool place. Go there if you can. It's only burned down twice since I graduated. So, you know, <laughs> I'm unrelated to him graduating, Un- unrelated, <laughs> <laughs> but, but interesting. We, we kind of came together later on in life. Dave had, David just had kids and Congrats. was like, you know, Hey, do you want to, do you want to actually give this a shot? And he had taken a job at the the vault in seattle and and so he uh he had some time to sit and write and we started writing together we started winning contests for script writing together and then we started shooting short films and uh, we took our last short film out on the festival circuit and got a lot of really good feedback and everyone was like you're gonna have to you're gonna have to uh make a feature next and so we went home kind of like man where are we gonna f- figure out a feature are we going to find funding for any of these scripts that we wrote and one of the one of the actors in our short film happy birthday dad was this guy craig jorgensen and craig as you know you've seen the thing he uh, he he uh, he's got some stories to tell from his time in vietnam and dave kind of took the took the opportunity to sit him down at his kitchen table and and interview him and i don't know it just kind of spiraled from there yeah i did a uh... It's kind of an oral history project, just two friends sitting down. And we had an au pair from South Africa at the time. You know, no connection to Vietnam culturally from South Africa like the U.S. has. And after it was done, she's like, oh, my God, I need to hear I need to hear more of this. And I was like, oh, maybe maybe there is something here. But Craig had said, wow, that was really nice. You should do this for my friends. And it kind of kept snowballing from there and next thing you know we're making a documentary which was kind of terrifying for people who started out as screenwriters <laughs> to make our first speech first feature with no script whatsoever and you know when you said you learned some things from the movie so mm-hmm. did we <laughs> but you know it did like many documentaries that um, if you you know we we got the advice early on that if you complete your documentary and you're all done filming, and it's the exact movie that you thought you were going to make, you didn't really make a documentary. You made an opinion piece. You went out, you you said, I've got an idea, and you went out and found a bunch of interviews that totally validate your worldview about the subject, and then made it. And that's, yeah, Yeah. and that kind of guided us. So halfway through, as we're listening to this, to these stories, we're like, I don't, I think we're chasing down the wrong story. I, we, we both said that. I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm taking credit. We said. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what happened is that um, you're talking about you're talking about the Sony Mark III. We uh, we tested we tested the Mark III's in our first round of interviews, and they 
they they weren't the video version right they were the brand new ones and they overheated while i was shooting video with them and I they know. shot yeah they had they, and you know nobody knew that that was gonna be a problem it was they were god they were what dave like a week old when i yeah we got them and we just wrote with them our yeah. photographer <laughs> picked them up and like played around with them for a day <laughs> <laughs> But the the end result was um, some of the some of the blown out footage that appears in the film, and and so we went back to interview R.B. Alexander and Tony Cortez. One of our interviews was Dr. Roy Clymer, who used yeah. to head up specialized care at Walter Reed, which is the big like the Veterans Administration Hospital in the U.S., like the the top dog, yeah. and and specialized care is dealing with post traumatic stress. So that that was a specialty and talking with him and learning such a better understanding of what post-traumatic stress is and how everything that we learned as as youngsters was not correct. I mean, I remember I was in grade school and we had a teacher, not my direct teacher, but one of the teachers at the school was a Vietnam veteran. Man, he loved talking about it. Like he all he wanted to do was talk about it. But all the other teachers would be like, Oh my God, don't don't talk to him. He's got shell shock and, and he'll go crazy or something. Knowing what we know now, talking would have been literally the best thing for him. Oh. And it's just a different understanding of, of life experiences is, is really what PTS can boil down to. You know, Dr. Climber said when a car backfires and there's three non-veterans and one veteran, the veteran will talk because where they came from, a loud noise like that meant the you know, death's coming at you at a couple thousand feet per, per second. But the group reaction is to say, well, none of us ducked, so you must be the one with the problem. And you yeah. should do something about that. But it's not. It's just we have much different life experiences. So it was kind of about bridging that gap and understanding. Am I, was, am I right by saying when that was said, that was when the fireworks came up in the film? Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, a lot of our veterans still to this day have trouble with fireworks. Understandable. Just, yeah. It's 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 just and it's not because they don't like fireworks, they do. It's just mm. it comes with very bad memories. <laughs> so what initially attracted you to the stories of Craig? How do you say his surname again, sir? Uh, Jorgensen. Jorgensen, that's it. It's similar to a, a European football. I didn't want to make that mistake. Yeah. Um, I just called him Greg for now. So and the rest of the Apache troop. And why did you believe these stories needed to be shared today? I worked with Craig at U.S. Customs and Border Protection. We merged when I was there. And Craig has written books about his experiences, so he's much more comfortable in how he talks about it. So he'll talk. Some of our veterans had never, ever, ever, ever talked. And... We had gotten it. Happy birthday, Dad! Had gotten into two different festivals on the same weekend. One was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, near Dustin, because he he lives just a couple hours north, and one was a couple hours outside my hometown in Washington. So Dustin went to Santa Fe, and I was like, "I'll bring I'll bring Craig to to this festival." And Craig was talking about his stories that day, and I'd heard them before, but so for some reason, I just I could visualize them like in a movie and by the time we got back to seattle as i told dustin i said hey i think we've got i think we've got our next i think we've got our feature here and it's about these guys but uh mm-hmm. and dustin met a producer dustin <laughs> yeah oh thanks yeah i met a i met a producer who had a lot of dreamworks credit on her resume and we we were going to la for some other meeting and met up with her at a coffee shop and talked to her about the project. And she got really excited about it and said, you know, you guys you need to do, a do- you know, nobody's going to fund your band of brothers exploit for Vietnam because you are two unknown guys and nobody's going to give you the amount of money you're going to need to make that good. Yeah. And what you can do is make a documentary about these guys. And so okay. we, we toyed that idea back and forth and we're, you know, kind of, kind of on the fence about it because, you know, I come from the animation side, which is the exact 
literally the exact opposite of documentary filmmaking you know it's all pre-production it's all you know you know what you're doing before you go and do it there's you know there's not a lot of editing it's all editing is about tightening things up and then moving on Mm -hmm. documentary is such a different scene which has been really cool for me because it's let me learn the whole other side of the industry that i didn't you know wasn't comfortable with already so anyway, so that's that's when Dave shot this kind of oral history project and put it up on YouTube and it got a bunch of views and they invited us to their they're having a reunion in Vegas where the the a lot of the blues kind of have their own but there's a there's an annual Apache Troop reunion and not a lot of the blues had been going to that it was mostly a pilots event and they started getting together on their own just just because they survived some really amazing things together. They had such a cool job and they, and, and they lived and, and, you know, the, the wild thing is it's the attrition rate is so high for what they were doing. And the part where these guys all are still alive and hanging out with each other 50 years later is just amazing. Noteworthy at the least. So so they invited us to Vegas and they started telling us their stories and man. Any stories in particular you can tell us about? I mean, at Vegas, there's got to be some good ones. I mean, not, I mean, just, just, it was, it was fun that they were coming together to, to be together and they, that they chose Vegas was kind of funny, but like, man, the, the operation that they were involved in, most of them were in their, late teens early 20s they were responsible for getting on an aircraft and flying to a downed helicopter and then making sure that the other airmen or or soldiers who were at the crash site either got home safely or or were were or, or their bodies were retrieved and i mean when i was when i was that age i was going to college you know i, I was you know starting out in the world i wasn't responsible for the safety of a bunch of other guys so it it really um i don't know man they're just really heartwarming stories of bravery and sacrifice honestly completely and and, i mean you know you talk to some of the pilots i'll I'll jump ahead a little bit the um the the pastor at my church had a little air cav pin on his on his suit jacket one day after church and so i i asked him about it because it's a pretty tight group the first night their cab is not they're not nobody and they don't they don't talk to anybody else you know they're pretty they're pretty tight-lipped and he it turns out served in fuk vin as a medevac pilot at the same time so that's where that's where we got him involved in the film and how i got the interview with father mike is that he he was there and so i i talked i got to talk to him and that, you know, all these guys are, the thing that really stands out to me is that they all speak so affectionately about each other, but they won't talk about themselves. So in order to learn about Tony, you got to ask Dwayne, you got to ask Craig, you got to, there's like, they're super happy to tell you about their super heroic friends, but they don't feel like they themselves are anything special. Why and, do you think that is the case? And how do you both Or how did you both react to that? Because it must feel a bit unusual when it happens more than once or twice or three times. I think it's what... uh, Go ahead, Dave. Well, A, you know, we had the talk with Randall Wallace, who did We Were Soldiers, and he's talked to a lot of different soldiers as well. And we were talking about, and it's it's hard, I think, and it's my opinion, I, I haven't been in their shoes, but... I think it's hard to think of yourself as a hero when you're just doing what you needed to do that day. Mm. You know, you saw your friend was in trouble and all you thought was my friend's in trouble. I mean, you know, I'm going to help my friend. I, you know, it's never like, Oh, this is my, this is my shining moment. Cue, cue the heroic music. Yeah. I'm going to be a hero. And also in March 19th, 1970, I knew about that day before we did the movie, because when I worked with Craig, he took every March 19th off because that's the day they should have died. And he would tell me, he's like, I should have died this day in 1970, like every day since then is a gift. So uh, most of them would take that day off throughout their career and then call each other. 
And I think when you're having those type of experiences and you're just like, man, I should have died today. It's really mm-hmm. hard to kind of reflect in other ways on it. Where we look at it, it's like, wow, 19 of you took on 300 enemy soldiers. 300 and didn't lose a man. Like that's that's a pretty impressive feat. And and Craig, I've teased him about his hero nickname. Uh, the first day I found out where, you know, another supervisor at customs brought in the CBS footage and, you know, Craig had never told us that his nickname was hero. And I said, like, if I would, if my friends nicknamed me hero, I'd have that on my business card. Like, hi, I'm Dave hero Merlino. And Craig, <laughs> Craig's like, I hate that nickname. I hate it. As, as a fun little aside, we found out who gave him that nickname while filming the movie because Craig came on our first road trip. And we were interviewing Jim Brown and he let slip 50 years later in front of Craig that he's the one who told Richard Threlkill that they called Craig hero kind of as a joke. Cause Craig was always out in front, like I'll lead the way. And they're, you know, they would call him hero to try and calm him down a little. See? And so it was, it was a nice nickname, but also like, Hey Craig, look, <laughs> well, no, it's, uh, it's such a, He's such a calm, like meticulous dude. He's he's really, really solid, solid guy. And and we had just we had just quit teasing him about being nicknamed Hero for like two days while we're on the road, and he gets called up by the editors at Kung Fu Magazine, and they were putting him in the Kung Fu Hall of Fame. And he was like, <laughs> he was like, no, 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 you can't. And <laughs> it was he's he's so quiet and unassuming. And a giant, just, just one hundred percent, all in on tracking survival, hand to hand skills. He's he's a real, real, real dude. Craig, I'll, Craig. I'll tell you everything you need to know about Craig Jorgensen. The Army Rangers have been trying for years to induct Craig into the Ranger Hall of Fame. A lot of it for, you know, the books he's written and everything he's done to shine light on the Rangers, but also from his time, he was with the Rangers before he joined Apache Troop. His friends were trying to nominate him, and he refuses to go in until his team leader goes in before him because he thinks his team leader deserves it. more. The day where their four-man team was ambushed, two of them were killed right away, including Craig's best friend, and his team leader and Craig, you know, fought. And they were told that extraction couldn't come and to leave their friends and they'll go back and get the bodies later. And his team leader said, nope, no way we're leaving our friends. You come get us. And so Craig is always, he's like, you know, he deserves it more than me. So I, I refuse. And I've tried to tell him, like, you know, if you go into the Hall of Fame, you probably have some more pull to get him in too. Oh, he's yeah. Like, no. yeah. Yeah. He's like, I will not I go see. in until he's in. So that's that everything like you know about Craig. <laughs> a pretty stand-up guy, that's for sure. That's very, very kind of him. But as yeah. the film deals with some sensitive subject matters, such as tra- traumatic experiences of war veterans, how has this topic handled to ensure dignity and authenticity were remained throughout the documentary? And you're asking the toughest question we asked ourselves every day of editing. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of thoughts to the dust, and I'll let you go first. I've talked a bit here. <laughs> You know, they're they're all stand-up guys, and they're all the kind of neighbor that you want to live next to. And as documentarians, y- you want to give a real solid swath of what it is that what it is that they experienced. You know, you want you want to show all the sides of the coin. You don't want to just show, hey, this great guy, blah blah blah. The reality is is that Dave is really good at doing interviews, and he would pull out of these guys really really raw emotional feedback about their experiences after coming back to the states and they they really opened up to us we're you know this movie is this good because they opened up to us so well about their experience being civilians about their experience with their traumatic stress and they you know they we've got hours of footage of that and so what we would do is really think about what we were trying to convey to the audience first off and then and then use that as kind of the the stepping point for editing sequences together and and getting getting those 
pieces together. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to embarrass anybody. And at the same time, you want to show how real it is for these guys, man. That's, I'd say one of the hard parts is sometimes when they're talking, they're, they're speaking at a very measured pace and, yeah. and which is, which is great for reflection. But sometimes when you're trying to, to hit the edit the long, the very measured pace. Kind of, and so sometimes we would have to cut down quotes and it's really easy to accidentally change the tone of a quote by cutting it out with a couple words sometimes sometimes filmmakers have done it maliciously you know mm-hmm. kind of what we talked about at the start when you're trying to prove your point and and there was a couple times where i would call the veterans and just make sure like hey i've got to cut down this quote is this still what you were trying to say like do you still agree with it but i think the heart the hardest part of the movie for us to edit is the scene with the downed helicopter footage from the, from the day. I mean, that all came about by accident. Jack Eugley had told us about his, his roommate who'd been killed and, and how they had to go retrieve the body. And then a year, a year later, Ed Beale gave us that, that helicopter footage that was recorded in the cockpit and just said, Hey, you know, my friend had recorded this. He gave it to me for safekeeping. He's gone, but I think it's time to turn it over to you guys for safekeeping and do something good with this. Okay. First thing we need to do is figure out how to get this off. This <laughs> <laughs> My daughters were like, what is this? <laughs> I was like, well, see, our generation started out with records. Then we had these, then CDs. Now it's, <laughs> we had to buy our whole music collection new each time. But uh, it wasn't, another year after that that we sat down to edit and i was like i think i think this is that day like i think this is the day that jack Eagley was talking about and then i hear his voice and i'm like whoa that's it's kind of like hearing not a ghost because obviously jack's still alive but to hear his 21 year old self oh man and he's so he's so calm and collected in that recording and you know that there's it's just we have uh, people shooting at us. Could you do something about that? We'll <laughs> <laughs> That's the great thing about your your documentary. You, you were able to get all of this together. You've got stuff from tapes. You've got different locations, different interviews, different styles. I love the close ups you use. The great use of close ups in the interviews, especially. Yeah. And the, was... the documentary production team presents a tapestry of professional backgrounds, from law enforcement to artistry. In what ways did this diversity enhance the storytelling within the documentary? I think it comes together. Well, I mean, it's made it easy for us to be able to divide our roles, especially between Dustin and I. Dustin, being the animator, has a lot more experience with the crew. And I have more experience dealing with with people from my law enforcement job. Dustin's going to get on me for glossing over. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, like when we, when we, uh, done, go. Dave, Dave won't. Dave won't come out and talk about the part where he ran a counterterrorism team and was responsible for interviews. Wow! I feel like if you're gonna have someone interviewing people for a documentary, maybe let your friend who's done a bunch of interviewing do the interviews. I don't know. It just yeah. seems like a real no brainer to me. And I agree. And the proof is in the pudding, man. That is that Dave got out of them just just beautiful beautiful footage of them really asking themselves questions like you can see you know especially especially Dwayne Bloor and and Ed Beal both have really really be- and I guess Doc too has Devalley has really really these moments that we capture of them asking themselves questions that they've you know either they're either looking at it from a different view for the first time or they're you know they're or it's something that's haunted them for years and they, and we got it on film while they're, while they're having this thing. And that is all due to the way that Dave navigated these conversations. How many members of crew did you have when you were shooting this documentary at a location? There was me, there was Dustin and there was our cinematographer, Charles Schaefer. Okay. Dustin was 
sound. Charles was running two cameras, and I was doing the interviewing. And yeah. you're, you're, you're cinematographer. I mean, bringing his unique vision to the project, can you share how he thought about capturing these untold stories through the lens? Or what did this Charles, Charles is like Hollywood camera royalty. His his <laughs> his dad's been a cameraman for E Entertainment for like his whole life. And so Charles nice. kind of came up in the business. At least that's what he led us to understand. He is so good, man. Like I'm pretty good. Charles is so good. He would come in and solve lighting problems without like with zero hassle. Like we must have set up in 40 different locations and he didn't blink at all. And he's got a he's got a lot of experience doing 48 hours, which is his uncle's show and he uh he man he's so good it's ridiculous oh, I'm <laughs> also, like, you, get that kid with us and he he came to us from he came to us from that first producer our our original cameraman decided that he'd rather keep his gig with uh, Macklemore doing he's a steady cam operator and Macklemore was doing a world tour and he was like I'm going to I'm going to go do this and we're like yeah okay that makes sense right who's <laughs> so, Macklemore He's a uh, he's an American hip hop artist. Okay. He uh he's from Seattle. He's 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 uh pretty big. He's like B level big. Like he had his moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's okay. still got he's still making good stuff. Uh, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, our first okay. camera Mac went out on tour and got a taste of all of the red cams and you know yeah people he's have an unlimited happy. budget and then there's us like uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so we asked. So, so we asked if anybody had anybody to recommend, and 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 Charles, we we had a we had a phone interview with Charles, sight unseen, like two weeks before we're going out on the road, and he sent us his reel, and we were like, yeah, this kid for sure, and it just it, it was so good, and and then you know we have this phone conversation, and it goes pretty oh pretty well, and. And the, the producer's trying to wrap it up. She's like, is there, are there any more questions? And and Dave goes, okay, uh, lightning round. We'll name your top five fast food joints. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be on the road together. And now we can get along. <laughs> <laughs> and he listed off stuff that we were okay with. And, you know, a couple weeks later, he climbed in the car. And the, he's so, he's like half our age and willing to put up with our shenanigans. I, man, I, I'll take that kid on the road anytime, man. I love that guy. I'm glad you had a, a brilliant working environment between the three of you, and he could gel with you both. And he, uh, man, he rose together. the occasion so hard. He started messing with us in the car. He really top tier. And the, the locations you went in, were there any lighting problems in those locations, or anything that stood out that may have even been upsetting for the veterans that were in the documentary? It was all shot in their houses. So all the well, buildings, on. their basements. What what didn't show up too much in the documentary, except there at the end, is um, we went out. There's a group of there's a group of reenactors in Louisiana who who go to this place called Tigerland Training Facility, which is where it's the place in the United States most like Vietnam, and it's where a lot of the guys who were getting trained to go to Vietnam did their training. Then it's a rattlesnake estuary now, <laughs> but it's really it's, hot and humid. It's, it's so it's so rowdily gross. It's and so <laughs> we went there in at the end of June for a weekend and with Craig, with Craig and and Charles just like and just rose to the occasion. Got found found a little pocket white bounce card so that he could use the natural sunlight to. To pull nice. up. Yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. He met, he shot really cool foot. And these guys are dressed up in all the reenactor gear. They had a fully automatic M60. Charles got this great footage of it firing. And we decided uh, we ended up not using it because just from a stylistic point of view, I think the reenactor footage just didn't it just didn't fit with everything else that we were, you know, with the the way the documentary turned, it just didn't fit. You know, once once we got once we got that audio from the helicopter and once the once the helicopter pilots gave us some of their own personal footage, that's that's one of the things that really turned out well for us. They had all 
compiled the super eight footage that they had, you know, they, they were pilots in Vietnam and they bought super eight cameras and they shot footage of each other mm. just messing around. And sometime in the eighties, they compiled it all into a video and, and, and then they shared it with us and let us, uh, let us use it. And it's, I mean, that's flying footage out of Vietnam. That's never been seen before. It's we're, we're so lucky to have that. Well, and, and what's nice about Tigerland is the, we went there three different occasions First time we went with Greg Jorgensen. Yeah, he had trained there before going to Vietnam. And the whole car ride over to Louisiana, he was totally fine with it. We're like, you know, you're going back. He's like, yeah, cool. I'm I'm excited to go. And as the the drive out to the training ground was about a half hour drive from our hotel. And as we every mile went by, Craig was like, you know, maybe we don't, maybe we don't need to do this. And as we were turning in, Craig's like, no, let's, let's go back. I don't want to yes. do that. And I'm like, Hey, Craig, we're in the middle of nowhere. Like <laughs> we're here. <laughs> they see us. And <laughs> he's like, I, I, okay. Like, I'm not sure I want to do this. But as soon as we got out of the car, like this, you could see him looking around and kind of coming to grips with it. And a lot of these reenactors have read Craig's books about vietnam and suddenly we called it we called him grandpa craig around the campfire because he would sit and they all pulled up chairs and were just sitting there listening to craig and man he loved it and then we went out on one of and why they do these reenactments is because they're used to it, it it just ended last year but they had the thing called the trail of honor in mississippi where you could walk down the trail and it started with the american revolutionary war all the way to now, they'd have reenactors in costume talking. You could ask them questions. And so they would go out to Tigerland in the middle of June to know what it was like to carry those packs in that 100 degree heat. So we went out on one of one of their missions. And Craig started out in the back with us. And then someone like, where'd Craig go? And he had run up front because he used to be a point man. And he ran up to the front with point. He's like, no, we don't want to go this way. Let's go off the trail. And then he was just walking around. He walked up to the guys playing the Viet Cong. And we're like, oh, so you got an ambush set up. And they're like, yeah. And he's like, I think you should go over here. I mean, he just, he loved it. And so we were talking to some of the other veterans. And they're like, no way. No way I will ever go back there. Ever, 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 ever. Second time we went back, we invited them. They're like, nah, I don't think I'm going to go. The third time we went back is because I got a call from one of them. And they said, we're going to go to Tigerland. Would you like to go with us? And to just watch that three-year progression. And so when we got there with this time with a big group of veterans, you know, the reenactors had an honor line set up to greet them. But I'll, what I'll remember always is Dwayne Bloor was the M60 gunner in Vietnam. And he, I don't think has fired a gun since he got back. He does bow. Uh, he said he's, yeah, he, 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 never fired a gun. he doesn't, but yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the reenactors had an M60 and Whoa. Dwayne was standing there talking to him and you could kind of see Dwayne looking at it. And finally he's like, are you going to let me shoot that gun or what? <laughs> <laughs> and then, so Dwayne, it, yeah, he, he recreated some of his famous footage from Vietnam of him with one hand. Yeah. He, he, he just to watch put them on a clinic that, about how to use that tool. It was crazy. It was, and then it, the reenactors were asking our guys for their, their autographs. And they're like, what you want our autographs is like, to know that some of these guys who were there had been spit on when they came back and yelled at to suddenly not having people want to want their autograph was a, uh, was a pretty fun moment. Doc Del Valley was like, what you want, you want my autograph. <laughs> so I could imagine. Yeah and, yeah. and being spat on when they said things like that. And, and one of the things that really stood out for me was when one of the people being interviewed said, that they went into somewhere, I'm paraphrasing, sorry, and they said, you served in the Vietnam War, didn't you? You should have your legs cut off. I mean, yeah, that was, that was Craig, who he was still in Vietnam. Someone took the time, to because he had been shot in front of CBS News camera, the footage ran, and someone saw that and thought, you know what, I should write this 20-year-old kid sitting in a hospital in Vietnam. I should write him a letter saying, I hope you lose your legs. What a what a fair and tolerant person I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's an unbelievable thing to say. And 
also one of the things I was thinking with Dr. Jack Farris, uh, with his academic credentials and sociology background, he played a role in the film's production. How did his research on basic combat training mesh with the film's portrayal of Vietnam War soldiers? You know, it's interesting. Jack Jack came to us kind of sideways. We were looking we were looking for a new producer, and Dave went to high school with Jack kids, and so we were driving up. We're driving up from LA back to Seattle and what's his name? His name's Bob, right? Bob Ferris. So, so we, Dave was like, I'll I'll call, I'll call Bob. He's a sociologist. Maybe he'll be the right, maybe he'll have the right lead for us going forward. And Bob said, you know, you should talk to is my dad, Jack's paper about, uh, about the kind of, about the kind of training that the command what did they, what they they have a special name for those guys well he did a he did a paper on the switch from the draft to the all volunteer army there you go yeah and, and dra- jack was drafted during vietnam he ended up not being sent but he was drafted and joined the army went all through that so he yeah he had a lot of insight as a sociologist of of that all volunteer mindset and uh he did another paper too, just about oh, about the public's perception of how s- soldiers are are portrayed. You know, we were looking for a sociologist to talk about pop culture's effect on on how veterans are viewed. You know, Band of Brothers, an amazing series, definitely holds veterans in a different regard than many Vietnam movies hold. <laughs> how they portray the soldiers, even though I mean, not a single one of the, the soldiers sent over to Vietnam are the ones who decided, hey, we should go to war with Vietnam. <laughs> like, it's not their fault we were there. <laughs> <laughs> so they were doing the exact same thing that World War II and modern soldiers, they're just trying to survive and looking out for their friends. But pop culture has definitely had an influence on how we view Vietnam veterans. And, well, and, but, and so we so we interviewed Jack and and it turns out that he's like probably one of the smartest humans i've ever had the chance to talk to every time he opens his mouth i get smarter he he had some real insight about not just not just being a soldier at the time but living a life as an american civilian after service and he gave us a couple of really great follow-up ideas so we pressed him into service as our producer and he jumped right to it. He was he was the first to kind of see that we needed to go back and talk to these guys again and see if it was the movie, <laughs> which is yeah, which ended up in the movie. Yeah, yeah. He he's just I don't know. He's so smart, man. That guy. Well, and I mean, he's very even keel. Dust and I, our friendship having formed in college, in many ways, not matured. <laughs> we get some <laughs> wacky ideas, uh, and Jack's. It's like, hmm, I see. Maybe uh, maybe we should do this instead. And the last question is, when is it available to watch for UK viewers? Oh, what a great question. <laughs> 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 Man, we already. Yeah. it's a weird year here in America. We don't, we don't have distribution yet. It, it's, a, it's a very tough thing to navigate post-strike. A lot of, yeah. a lot of the streaming services are trying to figure out who they are and what they are and and how to get back on track fiscally. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And where is it available to watch in the United States? Because I'll put the link to the film. Uh, the link that you got is a private link. Now, we are literally in our discussions right now with aggregators to see if That's we're going right. to put it up on a YouTube, or not a YouTube, on an iTunes or an Amazon for direct purchase, but still also talking with distributors about streaming services. So hopefully by late spring, we'll, okay. we'll have it up and ready. And well, what I'll tell you what, I'll the make a note circle back to you so you can put a note on the podcast where you can find it. That was what I was just about to say. Please do let me know, and I'll put that in the show notes uh, when it's ready and available for everybody out there to watch. And the I'll easiest put way to know is to follow us on Facebook at Apache Blues Film. That is the first place we'll shout it out. Sure. I'll, I'll definitely put your social media links and I'll put your website links in the show notes. Everybody listening, go and check them out. And I hope you're lucky enough to see the film when it's released because I've watched it. I've watched a lot of documentaries and I really, really enjoyed what they showed me. 
beautiful documentary that the world needs to see. Dave, Dustin, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and speaking to me. And I definitely hope to speak to you soon. Thank Jamie, you. thank you so much for having us, man. You're a real class act. Thank you. <laughs>